Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Love it. What's up, you guys? Welcome to another episode of The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week I'm honored to introduce someone who recently caught my eye and my heart, Project Montauk survivor, Dr. Charnel Wolverton Sihan. From the moment I watched her bravely tell her survivor testimony after mutual friend and survivor, Penny Shepard, sent her my way, I knew she was someone who would add so much value to the show and the information she's been whistleblowing and teaching is an important piece to the very big puzzle all of us have been working on putting together about the world. Having survived the things that were meant to destroy her, Dr. Charnel has also birthed the most beautiful career against all odds placed against her. She's a Swift Fire international author, having wrote five books, including her latest, The Science of Miracles. She's a naturopathic doctor, a minister, a mother and wife, a wellness coach, a decorated conference speaker who has done speaking engagements in over 44 countries, creator of her crystal oils and decree deck, teacher of online classes and workshops, including Swift Fire University, an exclusive online training created to empower participants to create supernatural shifts in their health, wealth, and business. She's a YouTube content creator on her channel, Dr. Charnel True TV, and host of her very own podcast, Swift Fire True TV podcast that airs on all major platforms, including Spotify. We all have so much to learn from Dr. Charnel and other survivors like her, and it's a gift she and others choose to speak their truths to us, even though none of us on the outside looking in can even begin to comprehend how difficult it must be to speak these truths from personal experience. Please give your full attention and say prayers to our amazing guest. And without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce to you today, the one, the only, Dr. Charnel Wolverton Sehan. Thank you for being here with me, Dr. Charnel. Awesome, Emma, and thank you for uh, even allowing me to share space with you and your viewers here today. I was, um, before we got on, you were talking, and I, everyone who's watching, you guys need to know this girl, her, the purity and her frequency is very tangible and detective. I'm sure that's why you guys watch her. She, um, she's pure hearted, and it's, I can feel it in my body when she talks. So she, I told her earlier, I mean, you could read the phone book and people would just would feel love and healed. It doesn't matter what you're saying. It comes through in your voice. And I'm just to share space with you today and with all your amazing people. I just I'm honored to um, to get to know you and to have this time with you. Oh, that means so much to me coming from you. And I felt the same way. I know I wrote to you in text. I when I was sent your video testimony from Penny, she said, oh my gosh, you have to watch this. Her information's incredible. And my jaw just dropped to the floor and hearing your genuine reactions brought me to tears. You know, it's like I said in the intro, I can't fathom talking about this, but also knowing how important this information is for people to hear, you know? So it's gotta be kind of that, that catch 22 for survivors to have all this information. And I just want people on the other end to understand that this isn't, you know, this is a, a different type of podcast where we're talking about some of the worst things that could ever happen to people. It's not always about how most podcasts are where they feature the greatest success stories and, you know, running multi-million dollar businesses and getting a yacht and all these things, you know? So I'm grateful that you choose to share because it's, it's a level of strength. It's a level of vulnerability and, and of compassion and love that 
I think is so valuable for people to see, hear, and watch. And it's just a great honor to have you on. And your story really touched me. So for a lot of people that listen to this show, they're new to a lot of the guests and stories. And there's so many things we could cover with you. As people heard, you're so decorated in so many different avenues. So there's a lot of different directions that we could take this conversation. And I'd obviously love to have you on more than once, but I'd love for people who maybe don't know your testimony or who have never uh, connected with you on social media or on any of your platforms, I'd love to maybe start with your childhood and talk about your family and some of your experiences. And um, we can gradually move the conversation to where you are now. Sounds good. Sounds good. So um, my, I was actually born in Montana, I'm told. And um, my dad is military or was military. He's retired military now. So we traveled quite a bit uh, all over the world and uh, mostly in the northern part of the United States and then also Germany and the UK. I was there um, when I was young, but then I came back and went to um, university over there um, for, a, for a part of my university. I was in the States for part. I kind of did both. Um, I, uh, I went to Bible school, believe it or not, uh, after getting out of college and seminary, I thought that I would be in some type of ministry situation service to others and thought that that was my only avenue. Um, I understand now that that's not true, but, um, just, I've always had a very, um, I had an encounter with Jesus at four. I was a part of Montauk from three to six. And I don't know actually if there were other times uh, that I was still a part of that. That's kind of hard to understand and explain um, because I've had missing time. I've had things come to me. I've had really some strange situations that I'm not sure if that's actually still some sort of tracking or checking in. I, it's, uh, lots of weird things have always happened and um especially missing time and um just uh actual seeing things with my eyes and having just strange occurrences but um after being in ministry uh for lots of years and doing conference speaking and traveling um just teaching about god and neuroscience and quantum physics and the supernatural dreams and visions um you know that was kind of my that's my passion of helping people remember um how to connect with god or source or whatever anyone wants to call this creator and um being able to use all all, the, all of our technology and our dna that has given that has been given to us um to to uh, know the future and understand ourselves and to create miracles and to connect dots and to discern, um, to understand dreams. And so that's kind of always been like a passion for me and doing that. Um, so, sorry, my daughter's leaving. Bye baby. Um, one of my kiddos. Um, so did that for years. And then uh, I actually got very ill and was ill about six years trying to reverse engineer that illness and trying to d uncover, discover ways to um, reverse what was going on or even diagnose what was going on. And I was using all the Western ways to do that because that was kind of all I knew, especially in, in military, they're pretty much, uh, you go to the base and you do the things. Um, so, but um, that wasn't working and it was getting me on a lot of different scripts that uh were causing more side effects and more issues and so uh supernaturally was led to um connect with some people in the uh, kind of more uh, naturopathic arenas and uh started studying more on frequency with health and understanding the the marriage of frequency with our bodies and with our biofield and started implementing some of the things that I was learning through a, a few doctors that then inspired me to actually go back to school and get um, my doctorate in, um, in naturopathic medicine. So I, I wasn't even going to go to school for the sake of ne necessarily open up a practice or 
whatever, I actually was genuinely like liking the content and understanding. You know, I just love, I'm a student constantly. I'm always studying and researching. And um, I thought, well, I'm already doing all these conferences. I, I, I was always doing conferences. I did that for 17 years. Uh, was on six planes a week uh, for 17 years. And um, I thought, well, if I can help myself and reverse engineer this, then I can help all these people where I would go to these conferences and retreats and churches and what have you and, and see some results because I believe in prayer very much so. And, uh, but I also would see people get instant miracles, but then go back to their lifestyle and lose it um, because of programs or behaviors and just the way that the choices they were making. And so I knew that there was like a missing link there. And um, when I was able to reverse engineer my own self, um, I had dropped like 80 pounds over a four month period, got off all my meds. And um, yeah, a lot of it had to do with emotional trauma. 86% um, of all physical issues are emotional trauma. And I had some memories of some of the things that were happening, but they were kind of like, I use this terminology as an expression, but it's like, if you had a bunch of glitter and you just like threw it up in the air or confetti or something, it was like all these parts and pieces of like glimpses of a flash and all these flashes, but there wasn't like a picture that was in this timeline that made sense to anything. And so uh, I felt very fragmented and just confused about some of these things, but, um, but anyway. How, how old were you whenever the memories started to surface? Well, a lot of them I, I always had. Gotcha. Um, I do, I remember being taken out of the classroom constantly. Um, they were always doing tests, there were blocks and like ink blot things. And then they would take me out. And when I was going underground, um, they were teaching me how to fly in seventh grade. I have no idea why I was in a simulator. Um, they said it was a plane. They said it was a P-28. I, who knows? I don't know what is really real anymore, but I had a written test. I had a simulator test. I'd score like a hundred on one and 98 on the other. Um, I never did any actual fly time. And I just thought, and two, like even being taken out of the classroom, I honestly thought like everybody was being taken. I didn't know that, that I was like an isolated situation. And um, so- You were very young, right? How old were you whenever- I was three to six in Montauk. But and this, there was- people who have heard of Montauk, what is Montauk, where is it? And uh, what is kind of a little overview of, of that program? Yes, yeah, so Montauk is in New York. And um, there's a peninsula like out over there um, that is one of the closest points going um, across to overseas. And uh, it was a place my dad worked on one of the radars there, a big, huge radar that, you know, they said was one thing, but we know that it was actually used for other things. Um, they were doing experiments on time travel and, um, and just frequency in general, they were, they would do different, um, hertz and kilowatts and, you know, all these different things, they would put it out and they would have strange events happen, weather changes. They would have, um, wild animals just show up and sit in the middle of the street, um, like zombies. And then they would turn it off and everyone would be kind of like, what? And they would go back. Um, they would mess around with the barracks of the military people in the cafeteria. They were doing it definitely um, using children underground, um, splitting altars and uh, tormenting electronically. Uh, you know, there was a chair uh, or a jump, jump chair. I mean, I just called it the chair. I know other, other people have different terminology, but um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I had a lot of that already. I remember telling my parents um, and knowing they were watching me from the moon. Um, there's some uh, connections there with the moon. And, you know, I never understood why they were watching me or what was going on. But I remember, like, being on car rides or whatever and looking out the window and being like, oh, they're watching me. And, you know, just uh, I remember thunderstorms 
uh, and or times when I would go sit on my windowsill, like I was waiting for them to come and missing time. I, even as an adult, I was, oh, maybe 2000, um, was going through a really rough time in, in this timeline and had went to my uh, guest room just to like pray and had been fasting and praying and I remember looking at the clock and it was like eight something 8 30 something almost 8 30 and then all of a sudden I felt like warm heat I, I saw a light out the window and I was like what and then this warm like heat or like um honey or something like a liquid would covered my entire body and I felt very loved and it wasn't fearful or anything. And uh, my hands were in the air actually, because I was like praying. And, um, and then all of a sudden I, I actually saw all this stuff and whatever. Anyway, it seemed like a minute. And, and then all of a sudden it was really, really, really bright light so much so that even though my eyes were closed, I felt like oh my God, God must be in my room or something like there must be someone, something happening because it was so bright. I don't know if you've ever had your eyes shut and then a light comes like a flashlight and you know, like, what is that? And you open your eyes and the whole room was so lit and it was, uh, it made no sense because it was eight, it was eight 30 at night. It was dark outside. And when I looked out the window, it was light, light. And I was like, where is this light coming from? And I thought it was coming from outside and so I got up to go walk out and it was just really light and then I came back and I looked at the clock and it said 8 32 or something like just a couple minutes had gone by and so I was like okay and I was very I felt really discombobulated and so I walked out of the kitchen and did whatever and then I looked and I realized that it was 8 30 in the morning and I had lost 12 hours so uh, just weird things like that, where it's like, I don't know what happened, but there's been times like that. Um, I know at 10, I had written a book called ESP for me. Um, I, I knew people's birthdays. I, I knew strange things about situations. I think that's why maybe they picked me, but um, I have memories of being in my mom's womb and them messing with me even then um so it's just it's like how you know it's kind of a lot to, to you know I'm there's a lot of really terrible things that I, I wish I didn't remember uh that I've always like thought I just had a really bad imagination when these things would come up I would be like oh no stop you know and just like try to block it or suppress it and just go like stop it Sean L, you know and um, but then, um, when people started more openly talking about dumps and children underground in cages and whatever, I was like, oh my God, this is like a real thing. And because that's what I remember, I remember being in cages underground, lots of children. Um, I know they use dogs and other things to try to scare us. It was very, very cold. Oftentimes we were completely naked. They would spray us with water and we would be freezing. Um, they gave us dog food to eat. Um, you know, it was just a lot of weird, terrible things. But, um, and interestingly enough, when I, after I moved back to Montana from New York, there was this little area in the front part of my grandmother's house where we were living. And it was just like a tiny contained little entryway of the house that um people would like put their shoes and their coats and stuff like a little mud room really really tiny and um the dog was not allowed in the house but they had they they would sometimes let the dog come and be in there uh, when it was really cold and I would go in there and I would hang out with the dog and eat the dog food. And I was always in trouble for like eating dog food, but it just seemed normal. So there's just a lot of things that like looking back, it's like, that, that's not, that doesn't really make sense. But, um, you know, and just so, but yeah, 
Um, your parents know that this was going on or did they have any comprehension of this or, or was your dad really just working and your mom doing her thing and they had no, they had no idea whatsoever that you were being taken out of class for this. They knew I was be being taken out, but they were told that I was in this tag program, which is like a talented and gifted program. Um, I, you know, I, they genuinely are amazing people and very loving, kind people. As far as my dad working on this radar, I have like grilled him, grilled him about, um, you know, what did he know about it, whatever. I mean, he can, he knows a lot about the actual technology. As a matter of fact, he was recruited by Westinghouse when we were in Germany and we went to Westinghouse, the VP of Westinghouse and stayed there, which Westinghouse was a, uh, in competition with um, Tesla back in the day and for their technology and, and maybe they were trying to recruit him for his knowledge about these towers. Uh, he didn't take the job uh, but we stayed at their at their house for like a week or so in um, in England. So, um, but yeah, I've asked him. He he worked on these towers. There's one in Japan. There's one in North Dakota. There's one. He was in Iceland. It, anywhere he went, it was always about these towers that had this satellite. Um, and he, you know, he doesn't. You know, I've asked him, like, do you believe in aliens? You know, all, all this stuff. And he's just like, oh, you know, but so I don't, I, everything is very compartmentalized in these projects. And there's some people who do this and some people who do that and this and that. And they're not all given information. There's no bleed over. They do it on purpose separately because they don't want anything to get out or to be um, compromised or, uh, multiplied or you know recreated um you know so i don't think that he personally had anything to know about that but i do i mean the, as an adult when i was even remembering more about some things i had sat down and asked my mom point blank like you don't think it's weird that they were teaching me to fly you don't think it's you know like all that stuff and and she was like well you were in the gifted and talented program and all this stuff and i was just like well yeah, but underground, and I had never said that to her before that minute, um, and I didn't ever have like physical confirmation that anyone had told me that or that there was anything underground. It was just my memories, and she had said, oh, you mean Montauk, and I was like, so you know, and she was like, well, I know that they have a lot of underground facilities, but I didn't know you were down there. And so it was just like, I felt like relief, but also like sad. Yeah, I can't imagine, especially because, you know, your parents were there with you the whole time, you know, and probably just thought they were doing the best that they could for you and sending you to a good school. And that's every parent's dream to have their kid in talented programs and to have these high test scores. That's very validating for a parent to you know, see that their child's accelerating in sports or academia, whatever it is. And interestingly, I've had a lot of the survivors that I've had on here that have affiliations with some type of government programs, wherever they were at, were also recognized for some type of gifts, whether it was a test that they took, uh, musically gifted. There's been a lot of different ways that I've, I've seen that express itself in these stories that seems like a lot of the, the testing programs and um, a lot of the ways that they acknowledge children who are in the top percentages of schools, especially in these, these areas that are known to have these you know, facilities and these things going on, it seems like they're more recruiting programs than actually you know, acknowledging a child or, or making it beneficial to the child. It's like, oh, we can see who might be good for these programs and they're targeted. Do you think that was were all the kids that that you know of in that program also uh, gifted in some type of way? Did you notice that that was kind of a common thing, or did you not really get to have that understanding back then? I I only know of two that I can remember now of being there. There was one face that stayed with me all the time. Yeah, could you talk about that? That was a, I think a lot of people will will know this name whenever you say it, but I think it's a really 
important piece of your story. And it's very fascinating. Yeah. Um, one person I, I won't mention because he's, he did go public and it wasn't a good, really positive experience for him. And he was, um, I don't, you know, but the other person isn't even with us anymore. Uh, Max Spears is someone that I actually, I remember, and, and it doesn't make sense to be honest, because he was, uh, there were six years difference in, um, in age and physical this timeline, but in my memory, he wasn't like little, like he wasn't, I mean, a matter of fact, 73 to 76, he wasn't even born till 76. So I have had my brain turn upside down to, you know, I, I didn't really talk about him. Now I, yeah, the way I, the way I things started happening is in uh, 2000, August, 2016, someone sent me a video and when, um, And when I, when I opened it up, I was like, oh my God, that's him. And I was super, I was really excited because it had just been uploaded like seven days before that day. I like immediately looked to see how old this video is. And, and you were automatically like, oh my gosh, I recognize him. It's him. Yeah, it's him. And I thought it was interesting too. One of the things that you had said was prior to seeing this video, you had had, and this might seem kind of weird for people, but you had brought up a photo of uh, Ryan Gosling oh. and Max put together and said that up until then, you all, for some reason, Ryan Gosling always triggered you where you have these emotional reactions to it and never knew why. And there's an incredible picture you have putting both of their faces together. And it's so uncanny how much they look alike yeah so that also had to have been validating to be like okay it's you know now I see why that face had yeah. that impact on me because it looked like so it looked so familiar because it looked just like somebody that I grew up with yeah I I, did, I never knew what I'll find the pictures because I think that'll help people see but yeah. I have screen share up too if it's uh, look at that oh wait just changed oh what happened but yeah um there's one and there's that's um, oh my gosh sends chills down my spine looking at it it's so what a connection that your brain made unconsciously. Um, Look at that, everybody. Yeah, I I wasn't, I was in a period of like watching and I would have like a physical reaction and a very emotional reaction when I would see anything with him. And I went through this period of like watching everything with him and just not, not in a weird, like, famous celebrity like I want to date you or anything like that it was just like what is this thing and um when he when this inter when this came up uh, I was immediately like oh my god there he is and I I simultaneously grabbed my phone and I'm like googling his name to because I'm like is he on Facebook like I gotta contact him maybe this will help me you know remember and then I found out that he had passed um, just a few weeks before that date. And for people listening, Max also had come out and was whistleblowing his experiences and his experiences were very eerily similar to yours, right? He was in the Montauk projects and came forth and decided to to share his story and yeah he for people who want to research he does have some incredible interviews out there that talk about a lot of information that's really valuable and I can't imagine how that felt for you to have that 
validation and that really positive feeling that, oh my gosh, here's somebody that that's going to understand. I know this person and to feel that loss of somebody that you don't know yet, you know, so well at the same time. Yeah. I mean, uh, and then there was like a lot of bleed, bleed through that happened like instantly. And, um, it was just this surge and then, then the major grief, like super bad grief of just like, I found him, but I lost him in like 10, 15 minutes. And, and he had helped you through some things back then, didn't he? It seems like he was almost like an angel in your life back then with some of the ways that he almost protected you. And he was very protective, even though he was I didn't see him as younger. I don't know how they do that. I'm told that they can manipulate and age regress and, you know, um, I'm sorry. It's, it's a lot, but yeah. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, he, there was one time when they were taking us to do some things that weren't good and he, I didn't want to go. And I was just like, ugh. And he was like, I'll go. And he like stood in front of me and basically shielded me and they took him. Oh, an angel. And you can tell when you watch him too, he has this presence that you can just, you see his heart right away when he's talking and the purity of it. And so with, with these programs was the goal of Montauk, was that time travel and what was the point of doing all these experiments oh they were trying to tap into other dimensions other timelines other earths um planetary other planets uh i i have memories of jupiter definitely the moon um you know parallel places i'm not really sure uh yeah, I don't, it's hard to, I don't know what all they were doing to be on. They didn't tell us what they were doing. You know, they just used us. I know, I feel like they used me for like psychic abilities. You know, like you said, I'm pretty sure they pick, pick you uh, based on like a bloodline or whatever. Uh, my, my dad has quite a, a background, a Masonic background, and then also Scandinavian on both sides is like a seems to be a common thread um but uh so yeah um i was born at 333 that's a mason number for sure um the doctor who delivered me is also the same doctor that delivered my mom um and his name is dr harold messenger which i just think is kind of interesting but um you know i have like I wrote a lot as a kid. I mean, who writes a book at 10? Right. Um, that book's missing. I don't know where it is, um, but I, I, I wrote music and I, I was going to be in the music industry. And I, I remember at like 12, writing a song that run like one like first place in America for like against adults. They didn't know my age. Um, and I think maybe I was primed for being stationed in that field or something. I know Max was stationed for like acting. They thought that he would, him and Orlando were supposed to be actors and um, he started having his memories. And so they, he didn't go through with that. He became who he was and started whistleblowing. So I mean, I don't even think they called it a whistleblower probably. <laughs> I don't know. He just was talking and um, but uh, I wrote, and I remember writing a song called Daisy Chains or a poem called Daisy Chains because um, there's, a, there's a man, a part of the, I don't like saying the word or his name, but uh, we'll just say World War II. And he was part of Paperclip. I can say that. I don't use the N word because of YouTube and takes it down, but um, started with a J and his last name starts with an M. And he was a part of a lot of these twinning projects and oak tree and genetic things that he did. And one of his, like, um, even in, in World War II with this, some of the survivors, he would do this. Um, uh, 
Daisy thing where he would be, he loves me, he loves me not kind of deal. And if it landed up on he loves me not, then you were tortured or killed. And they did this in Montauk too. And I had um, written this poem called Daisy Chains. And I was like seven. And it was like, imagine you living in shackles too. And I know you don't feel the pain. You don't even know my name, living in daisy chains. And it's like, what seven-year-old is writing shit like that? So, um, and I have my first, one of my, my second tattoo is like a daisy with the petals on, except for one that would equal, he loves me not. Which again, I did that, but I didn't know why. I, I, I had not yet had that piece. I knew what I wrote and I remembered shackles and I remember terrible things, but I didn't connect it to all the things yet until much later. I mean, even like the wolf stuff, um, like the animals would never hurt me. And they were really mad about that because they would try. And I was um, not. And they'd um, use real wolves in these and, programs? Too? And, and fierce, huge dogs to like send down hallways to, to get us and freak us out and scare us. And some people, it really worked, but for me, I have this thing where they would come like they were going to charge and, you know, foam coming out and the whole thing. And then they would get a certain place and then they would just stop in their tracks and then just like lay down and want me to pet them or whatever. Like, um, I've always had a thing, but I, but I'm not a fan of snakes. I cannot, I know they use that too, or any kind of rep, reptile. I am, I can't even look at a picture or anything like that. So that was something that was definitely, I think part of it, but I, I don't, I, I can't speak to that. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And um, so, yeah, there was like bleed through that I would try, would write about. Uh, I wrote about time all the time. I wrote, I wrote a song or a poem, so time's what makes the difference in our lives, things we got or things we need to do, time changes the way I feel for you, time to say I love you, time to make it right, learning, feeling, understanding time, time brought the morning and the night, everyone wants the clock to stop, move it a little faster, we need to live in the time we've got, it's too late anytime after, like just like lots of, everything was time, and I was very obsessed with that, and so it's like why, but you know, everything was about time travel. There was, there was a pyramid that I know Max and I were sent to get back or retrieve that they had stolen that would allow time travel uh, on a, on a individual and or group way without the chair. Um, it's a black pyramid, had a four part base and would point up and it could lay flat, like a kind of like a star. And then it could also go underneath so it could point this away or go flat or point this away and kind of like a Merkaba maybe uh, if you were to take them like this that that's what they would it would look like um, and something when you would do it they would we could go like if we were touching anything we could go wherever and then and do you, do you remember ever going anywhere or were you able to use that technology or did you just have the knowledge of what it did? I only remember using it once when we had to retrieve it. Um, we, 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 I was standing on this corner and we, and I was first like looking around the corner, Max was behind me. I don't, I know there were other people there, but I don't remember who and I was, I had stepped out to turn the corner and they started using this energy weapon to try to hit me. And he pulled me back to keep me from getting hit. And, um, and we had it at that time, we had already retrieved it. And then we kind of like went step backward and um, basically set it up and used it and got the hell out of there. That's, uh, that's another bleed through that it's just like, you know, I don't know. I don't understand it. And we were adults then doing this. So it's like, we weren't kids then. So again, it, it doesn't make sense about, and, and look, 
I I know people might be watching me and like, oh my God, whatever, Chanel. I, and I don't care. It's fine. Like I, I understand it's not believable. I don't believe it half the time. I, I believe you. I, I thought I was crazy, and I never talked about it much because it doesn't make sense. And I'm very logical. I'm a scientist. I'm, I'm very data. I'm very evidence. I'm very, you know, this cannot be proven. There's no proof. And it sucks because I'm, a, I'm very driven by data and research and I don't have anything concrete to say I was there or this happened or anything. Um, I know that my birth certificate says Montana, my social security card actually just found out is from Montauk. I don't know why that is either. I only found out because I was having some things with my parents and they were setting up all their, you know, wills and trusts and asked us to bring our things over. And when I, I know social security cards are normally like the first three numbers based on your state that you were born in. And my mom and I were supposedly born in Montana. So I had expected putting these on the table that her and I would match. And instead of me matching with her, I had the same as my sister, which she was born on the base there. And so I was like, wait a minute, why, why does this say Montana? I mean, why does this say Montauk instead of Montana? And so I don't, I don't understand that either. And I asked my parents, like, why do I not, why does that not match? Because my birth certificate says this and this says that. It's all confusing. But so again, I, I all that to say, I get it, but also, your memories are all that you need to validate it. It's, it's a shame that something that's true to you, people would ask for proof, but I think most people listening, your story aligns, that's always how it is. And that's the point, right? Abuse can happen because they don't give you evidence. If they gave you all the evidence that you could present, everything would be actually exposed, you know, because that's how you prove things is through tangible evidence. And that's done by design, you know, and that's why your, your voice and your story is so important because your memories are evidence of this and they corroborate with other people's memories that have had these experiences like Max, you know, you can listen to some of his interviews and see the crossover, you know, why does, why does he have the same exact memories that you do? Why does somebody like Penny have the same type of memories that you do? And, and you guys don't know each other, you know, there's reasons why? And I think your memories are all that your memories validate everything, you know, and for people who aren't ready to hear it, they're probably not listening to my show. And, you know, I pray for them when they do learn all of this, because it's going to be really hard for people who have looked the other way all this time and don't even try to listen, you know? So well, I, well, I believe you and your story, your story really corroborates a lot of other stories that I've heard. Well, um, that's good to know. And I haven't, studied a lot of Max's stuff and I definitely don't know anything about Penny. I, I just the little blurb on her Twitter. Yeah. Um, but um, I've never really had anybody say, can you prove it or get all like weird about wanting me to prove anything? Because I honestly don't talk about it. Like I, I just shared one time on Carrie Cassidy show like two, three years ago. And then um, just recently did a show on my channel. Um, but what what some things that helped me to confirm my own self were because I had never been public and and actually didn't believe in like mediums or like because of my programming of Christianity uh, doesn't really do that stuff but you know I was just kind of like looking for people to interview for my show and there was a guy named John Thomas or Thomas John Anyway, he's a seatbelt psychic that's on Netflix and he's very accurate and just likable. And I was like, oh, he'd be fun to just get his perspective. And so I did a, like a pre-call with him and immediately he was like, my grandfather's name, you know, my dad's name, my mom's name, my, my aunt who had passed, like knew every, all kinds of things about me that were definitely not on the internet. And one of the first things he was like talking about Max and saying this guy that you were with when you were a kid. And then he was like, he's coming through and he's saying like, um, they killed me. They killed me. I, he, he was like, he was murdered. And I was like, what? And I, cause I was confused that he would know that. And he was like, he's saying that he was murdered. And he said, they turned off his DNA and you could tell 
that this the guy saying it was even like this this is creeping me out like he was getting creeped out and I was interviewing him like just to talk to do the show like it was a pre discussion and he had actually just got the thing and um and he was saying some things that Max had said about this thing and and you could see as he's saying it he's like basically oh shit and then he kind of quickly got off the call and then he ghosted me <laughs> and he was like, probably like, I'm not going on her show. And he also said like, well, you're talking about, he says that you're talking about the same things that you're sharing the memories that you're. And then he says to me personally, you know, not Max, but the guy said, you're not afraid of talking about this. It sounds like he was killed for talking about this. It says, so he's saying the government killed him. And he was like, you're not afraid of talking about this. And I was just like, uh, no, I mean, I've been talking about it. And, and then he was just like, poof, I'm out of here. And then like, he wouldn't respond to me for eight months. And then this just last April, I contacted his assistant. I tried for eight months to say like, hey, are we going to do this? And kind of gave up. And then I got his assistant and then she scheduled him. And I think he forgot who I was or just got on because of whatever and wasn't putting it together. And um, he got on and like started talking and didn't remember talking to me. And then all of a sudden he was like, oh, there's this guy coming through, Max. And you knew him when you were a child, but you, you know, he was like, I'm trying to understand. And then he kind of said almost similar things. And then he was like, oh, and then he realized I've done this before. And then he was like, okay, bye. And then, <laughs> so oh, that wow. happened. And then a lady who used to cut my hair in high school, um, she started going into more like intuitive medical and she saw like on Facebook, I haven't talked to her since I was in 11th grade and she just happened to see that I was doing biofeedback. And so she contacted me and she's like, Hey, I'd like to get a biofeedback scan. I'm an intuitive med medical person, blah, blah, blah. You may not remember me. I cut your hair when you were 11th grade and la la. la. And I was like, Oh yeah. Hey, nice to meet you. And maybe we could do trade and you could do me and I'll do you, or maybe you should be on my show. I have the show. And, um, she was like, Oh, okay. I did. I, you know, how's your mom? I hadn't, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden she was like, why do I keep seeing you in this chair with like electronic, like a helmet thing on your head with like wires coming out, being electrocuted. And I was like, what? And I had zero on the internet. I had told zero people. And it's, I mean, just like my husband and a few you know, very close people. And she was, and it was just like, so for me, as much as it sucked to, to validate, it also was like a relief to feel like, oh my God, I'm not crazy. Like here's people on the outside who are confirming these memories, but yet, and it was again, yeah, sad, but also like, okay, I'm not super crazy. I'm not going to lock myself up here, you know? So yes. Now, how did your, how did your parents react when you started telling them what you remember? Were they supportive and are they support supportive or was it more kind of, no, that didn't happen. I think you're just imagining it. No, my mom, your... my mom is, well, my, I don't know how much my dad knows. They don't watch my shows. Um, again, I've only talked about it publicly on another person's show, Carrie's show. And then just this one time on my show. So it's not like we all sit around on Easter and talk about stuff, you know, but I did sit down and talk to my mom and she was just profusely sobbing and just, you know, feeling like she let me down and disappointed and, you know, just sorrow for, you know, feeling like she didn't protect me. And, um, but my dad has been going through some health stuff and, I, you know, we I don't, I didn't like confront him or talk to him about any of that yet, but yeah. I don't know if I ever will. I mean, I, I did ask him questions about what he did there and, you know, re really got a lot of information, but never, I haven't physically said, well, why didn't you, you know, what, whatever, or, you know, anything like that. Gotcha. And was, uh, was your father a mason also or was that more generationally like his father and then kind of your lineage through grandparents his dad my mom my dad never got involved um yeah. his dad and all the way probably i don't know how far back but 
but yeah. That, that also seems to be so common that even if it's not the immediate parents of the survivor, that that tends to be in the lineage for people who seem to be chosen for a lot of these programs. Now, when you started to get these memories and, you know, that can be really scary going public or talking about it. What inspired you to even want to talk about it to people or to, especially on a public podcast or, you know, to people that you might not know very well? Well, when I was connecting all this stuff with Ryan, Ryan Gosling and Max, I started going down this rabbit trail because I know Max had even mentioned on on somewhere. I haven't looked at a lot of his stuff because I, I want to keep it like, I don't want to be influenced by anything that he may say and go like, oh, me too. And then it's like, I need, I want to confirm myself. It's it's like the only way I can get data is, is that way. Like, I don't want to be, I don't really watch a lot of anybody on it, to be honest, because I want to get pure um, information from my source and or my memories. And, um, but when I was on this rabbit trail with, with, with Ryan and the connection, uh, I had looked and, and I was finally able after three years after I had found Max, well, two, two, 2016, 17, 18, 19, Oh, six years has been, was finally able to look at a Ryan Seacrest. I keep saying Ryan Seacrest. I met Ryan Seacrest when I was pregnant with my second kid. So I keep saying Seacrest, not, not Ryan Seacrest, Gosling. Um, when when I, I watched some things recent with him and I wanted on purpose to watch something with um, this one where he had a mannequin because I had all of a sudden felt like to, to find out about the mannequin project or project mannequin. And I, I had, um, so I watched it and then Carrie actually called me that night, which we don't talk every day, but she happened to call me about something else. We do a show every once a month and we have for a couple of years or three years. I don't know. It's been a while, but, um, she, when she called, I said, what do you know about project mannequin? I'm trying to find anything I can. And she was like, uh, well, look up Dollhouse. There's like a movie Dollhouse. And then look up, um, what else did she say? This guy, Donald Marshall, and that he had some things with some books or something about cloning. And, and I said, well, I just watched this movie and Ryan is in the movie and he's carrying around this mannequin. I did it on purpose because I thought mannequin and that there might be some clues and as soon as the movie comes on, like one of the first things is someone calls him Mr. Sunshine and Sunshine was, was Max's like trigger word for all to going into an altar. And I was like, Whoa, like, why did the, do they just say that? Like, I was like, I mean, I picked up my phone and I'm like Googling the movie to see like, what's his name in the movie? I knew it was Lars, but like, is it Sunshine? Is that his last name? And it was a different name. And I'm like, why are they calling him that? And, but then I started, so then I started looking up Ryan and found out that he had a band that started in 2008, which I didn't know he had a band. It's a two person band and Max had his memories come through at 2008. And so Ryan starts this band called Dead Man's Bones, which for me, with my background in ministry, my first thought was Ezekiel dead man's bones, the valley of dead man's bones. And so I look up Ezekiel 37, which Ezekiel is all about like aliens and spaceships anyway, and off planet stuff. But um, the Merkaba, the wheel within the wheel, you know, the, that was all a spaceship and stuff. But um, 2008 and then in here, it's dead man's bones. And it starts talking about um, blowing breath into these bones and then like um, ligaments and joints come together. And then he's like, now, now blow from the fourth winds that, you know, and then, so he does as he's commanded and it becomes a quote vast army. And one of the things that Carrie had said on the phone, right, right. Pre um, previous was, you know, they're building this army. This clone is for an army because they think there's going to be like an ET war and they want these soldiers who have, you know, these skills, but also are very obedient and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh my God. So 
when I asked, I started Googling, where did they get the name Dead Man's Bones, like for this band? And it came back from Disney. And I was like, okay, we know about that. And then also it came from this guy um, from Red Hot Chili Peppers, these two guys from Red Hot Chili Peppers, which one is Flea and one's Chad. Well, coincidentally or not, literally three, two, three days earlier, I, we were watching American Idol and this girl was one of the candidates or whatever contestants. And she had said, oh, you know, my dad is uh, Chad so-and-so from Red Hot Chili Peppers. And my husband, who this isn't his wheelhouse at all, had said, oh, AKA Will Farrow. And I was like, what does that mean? And he was like, you don't know. And I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, it's a big thing. Cause he looks just like him. And he pulls out pictures. And I was like, oh my God, they look just the same. So now here we are three days later and they're the ones who, you know, this guy who I say, I was, I looked at it straight. I'm like, that's a clone. That's straight up a clone. And now Ryan, he started his band from that. And they used the choir that these guys had used in their um, songs, which one of the songs is my body is a zombie for you. And I'm like, really? Like, so Ryan wrote the song and it's my body is a zombie for you. And like Max has said he was a, his clone and he's older than Max. So it could easily be cloned from Max and Max didn't take his role in in uh, Hollywood. So maybe they made Ryan to do that. I'm not saying that this is true. I can't prove anything. I know that Ryan's from Canada. So I thought maybe, I know there's a base up there underground where they do a lot of the stuff and Michael Prince or James Cosbo and Max were there. And I was like, well, maybe he was close by, but there was another one that had lyrics um, that, that the children were singing kind of inappropriate lyrics that said um, like, like lambs to the slaughter, you know? So it's like, it was just bizarro, but um, so yeah, all of those things when I was just started like putting some stuff together and I, and I Googled, why did they call it that? Because the, their band is that, and then their first album is that. And it said that it was Ryan's love for the paranormal, which I didn't know he had a paranormal, more normal, like, I, I mean, I guess yeah. I wouldn't talk about it, but, um, you know, I don't know. So again, this is all me making up a bunch of stuff that I'm just expressing and some, you know, saying like, there could be something to the fact that maybe both of them started having memories in 2008 and then his, his band formed and he created this album as an expression of getting some of this stuff out. He also had a a song called Werewolf Heart, which I have, a, I mean, that's a big deal with, with Montauk. And also we were called a wolf pack. We were in five people. There was five, uh, four, four guys and a girl and they're in this, they called them packs. And um, I've, I've always been obsessed with wolves. Apparently I'm told now that Max had German shepherds and wolves. I've always had German shepherds and are not wolves, but a husky. I have the same dogs and obsessed with that. I even had this ring created um, a few years back and also just found out that this turquoise is his, like his birthstone, which I don't know these things in the natural. Like I'm, I'm just creating, you know, uh, you know, I don't. Conscious mind is like expressing itself and it seems intentional, but it's, it's not almost, it's like from, from your memory and your heart. It's all the subconscious stuff that I'm like expressing or putting together, or it's like those pieces of, of the graffiti, you know, graffiti, or, I mean, um, confetti that I'm just like, oh, these two go together and these two go together. And that makes sense. And again, not provable. Um, but I can't make them go away. Like I, it's like, how do you pr prove the Holy Spirit or God or, you know, it's just, it's either you believe it or you don't. And I, I'm not going to try to convince anyone or defend it, or it's just like, this is what it is. Take it or leave it. I'm cool if you are not, and I'm fine. And I'm, I love you just the same and not just you, but I mean, in general, like kind of, that's my attitude. And I feel there's times when I can really 
research and I'm like on this path to like pull more together. And then there's times where I'm like, oh my God, I just gotta like, I gotta like integrate and back off and like cry. And, you know, there's, I mean, there, there was a good several years. I mean, really, honestly, when I first saw the video, when he came up in 2016, I didn't, I couldn't barely even talk for three days. Like I was just a mess and I, I lots came through. I was like, I thought maybe then I might lock myself up. Like I felt that crazy with everything that came through then. So, but why did I come out? Um, Tony Rodriguez has been a, an amazing part of my support journey. Um, and I had him on my show a few times and he just came out with his book. And I hadn't really dove into things for a while. And then I had him on a show maybe like a month ago. And then it was kind of like sparking some things. And then all this stuff with Ryan and um, the mannequin. I was just like, I just found all this stuff. And I, I felt like pressure. I don't know how to explain it. But when, when I get like a lot and I know I have to talk, it's, it's like, I feel like I'm going to explode if I don't either write or paint or speak. And in this case, it was like, I have to say this, I have to say this. And it was like, not something I actually wanted to do. Um, and I don't know how much I'll have to continue doing it, but it was like, and as soon as I did, I felt like so much relief, like I can breathe and I feel really like my body could be at ease. And it was just like, you know, um, I was like in my mind going, if this can help one person, like even one person who feels crazy and maybe have some kind of thing that would trigger or help, you know, because Tony's helped me and other people that probably maybe you've interviewed have said things. I, when I talked to Penny, I called her and I just, I can't even believe she would talk to me. I was just like, oh my God. And I, when I called her, I think we were on the phone for six hours, maybe at least five. And it was just like a safe place for me to exchange information without feeling crazy. And her telling me some of her stuff that it was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, me too. And, and so I was like, you know, she helped me and Tony helped me. And I'm like, if I can say someone that would help any single person not to off themselves or, you know, cause a lot of these people, when they get their memories that they, they use drugs and they use alcohol and they, they commit suicide and they, they don't, don't want to be here anymore because they can't handle what comes through. And, um, I just want to, I want to help people integrate. I want to help people remember. And I like that word remember because R E dash capital M E R, you know, like to, to be in one union with source to take those fragments and like to get in union with source again and just to be whole and um and that and that's what my book uh i have several books but the science of miracles talks a lot this is yeah talk to me about that that's i love the name of it and the cover is so beautiful so this is actually the pyramid um if it was flat upside down either way but it's the Merkaba, and this is what's in Ezekiel actually too, but uh, the science of miracles, remembering the frequency of love. And it talks about a lot of things about just some kind of, um, I like to take hard things and make them like really easy for like even a kid to read this book and be able to have a life of miracles just regular all the time. And actually I have a lot of kids who have read the book and adults who like either made cheerleader out of nowhere or uh got a job or you know got had a made, made friends at school or um you know got into a school they wanted to get into or as adults like partnership marriage um getting the job they wanted or whatever um because there is everything is code and we have this field around us. Some people it's bigger, some people it's smaller. I can measure it actually in a soul audit. I can see what your width is and I can see what your radius is. And everyone has this field of information that's, that is projected 
and radiating out from their cells. We all have a signature code that goes into the cells and then radiates out into the field. And some people's field, like I said, are an inch. Some people are inverted, which means they can't even generate their own energy. And they basically siphon from other people to survive, which is not good. Um, so I like helping people remember how to generate their own and to radiate positive things. So when they're out and about, that they're conscious of uh, touching people with love and truth and igniting people to health and truth and love, just like Paul in the Bible, which or Jesus, you know, um, I, I personally love Jesus. I'm not like a religious person at all. I, I'm, I know the Bible has been extremely compromised and mis miswritten and taken things out. And, but I look at it as quantum physics and actually Jesus has the highest scalar waves on anyone I've ever tested. And, um, but I've tested animals too, like horses are, their biofield is 350. Um, and dolphins are unmeasurable. Jesus is unmeasurable, but um, kittens, they purr at one, or cats purr at 157 megahertz, we're 67 megahertz. And actually when I was tested, interestingly enough, what the radar would would shoot off was around 400, pretty regular, that 450, 400, which 500 is love, 400, 450 was what it would shoot. And this is what's in my field. So I'm wondering like, after being there for so long, did I just, just, just pick up the resonance of that? I know that I have to be very conscious of my thoughts because um, I can help, I have helped with weather changes and or created bad weather issues or, um, or like when I would travel a lot, I, I would see the forecast and I'd be like, I'm not having that. So I would already start like changing it. And it would be like, this is what I want. I want 76 degrees, sunny, you know, not, not too blazing, blah, blah, blah. And by the time I get there, everything would be like the snow melted, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've had like really crazy stuff happen where uh, not all the time, but, but sure. there's been, you know, that, and, and actually in, and when I had an astrology reading, which again, I, this was against some of the programming and my, I didn't grow up in church, but my, my, I started going when I moved to Louisiana and then I'm, I'm not in it anymore. But so I got an astrology reading and the lady was like, what happened to you as a kid? It looks like some kind of dark forces with Pluto. And it was like Jupiter was over it, which amplified it. And then it was something with technology and time travel and she was like, um, things happening really, really fast. And I was just like, and this is again, years and years ago before anyone, before I told people, except for my very close thing. So it was again, more confirmation. And then she was like, you know, you need to be really careful about like, you can change the weather. She said, you know, you have to be careful with your emotions because you, you can change the weather. And I was just like, no one's ever told me that. Like, I mean, I teased about it. I would be like, look, 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 I'm going to do this before we get there. And it was a joke, a running joke with the people I would travel with. They'd go, you know, it's going to snow tomorrow. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm going to fix that, you know? So yeah. Anyway, that's a lot. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking too much. No, that's, it's amazing. Uh, Penny was the only other person I've ever had on that mentioned, you know, weather modification. And it just brings to light how many things that are suppressed about our abilities. We're taught we only have five senses, you know, and if our if we're not cognizant of something existing, then it really doesn't. Like we create our reality with what we know and, and believe, you know. So I feel like this is it's fascinating hearing what we're capable of that many of us aren't even aware of that's just inside of us. And I'm sure more people are uh, susceptible to experiencing these gifts on a different level than most people you know, and that there's different levels that these things can be experienced or manifested in real life, but it's just amazing. And I think that that's what your work does it, is it's helping educate people on things that are inherent in us that we either don't know about, or we forget about, or we're just unaware of, you know, and I'd love for you to talk about some of your social media that you're doing and some of the other work that you're doing too. And obviously it'd be awesome to have you on again and just 
spend a whole episode diving into all of it, but you have your, you have your hands and feet on so many different things. And I'd love for you to talk about all the ways people can support you and, you know, about some of your online courses and your other books and things like that. Awesome. Well, and you're doing the same thing. Yeah. This is what you're about. You're bringing information out to the forefront. You're bringing on other people and, and, you know, with your heart and your purity and your love and your integrity, you know, your I can see, you know, your service is very important. And, you know, for all of you viewers who are watching, you know, I don't know her like personally, I just met her briefly before, but I know instantly when I meet people, I can see their field. I can feel, I hear their sound. I know their frequency, if it's a fit and if, if their motives are right, and um, so what you're doing is e we're all doing it, uh, hopefully. I mean, well, not everyone is doing it, but, you know, I just thank you for your service as well. And for all of you watching, you know, everyone has their own thing that they're doing. And I can't do what these you guys are doing and you guys do things that I can't do. And that's what's so beautiful about us each being just a cell of source, you know, so diverse in our own realm of you know, community to, you know, we need each other and there's no separation and we're not isolated. That's all just an illusion to keep us feeling lonely, but we're here for now and we picked it and this is what we're doing. But um, yeah, as far as what do I do? I mean, I, um, you do I, it all girl. <laughs> I teach a lot. I do tons of interviews every week all over the world. I've been, you know, I used to travel before all this stuff happened and, um, and then it moved all in. I was on TV for three years and then it moved online and, um, you know, even traveling, um, moved online. And so I do conferences online. I do teaching online. I'm on podcasts all the time. Um, I've written five books. I've written, um, keys to third heaven is one of them. And the science of miracles is one of our, my new ones. I wrote, this is just a little tiny, tiny book. The Sears handbook kind of talks about like feeling, touching, like understanding things. Uh, I have like a course on dreams and visions. I have muscle testing. I have, um, health stuff like, um, I'm keto. Um, that was a big part of my health um, transformation of, of just being able to get my dis-ease into ease um, and clearing some things that were diagnosed. Um, I have a crystal card deck that people use for like Reiki massage or just like educating. I actually picked a card for you, Emma. I actually picked Smoky Quartz. And on the back, it says smoky course is very grounding, has the ability to amplify itself crystals around it. This crystal is amazing for physical healing or transmitting all things that are not for our highest benefit. This crystal is a huge support physically for fluid regulation, AMF protection, chemotherapy, headaches, depression, and more. And then I always have a decree with each of my cards. I am secure and grounded and I stay. And the companion oils are myrtle, lemongrass, spruce and frankincense which i can text this to you um but yeah. i've been on this like lemongrass kick lately i don't know why but i recently bought i have an oil for my dog because it repels ticks and fleas that i put on him and then for me i found this uh essential oil face cream that has lemongrass in it and i have just been loving it for whatever reason that smell it's been like the last few months i've just been like attracted to it so you're already doing it. Your intu your intuition has kicked in. But yeah, so there you go. Thank but you. yeah, I have um I have Swiftfire University. I have so many online courses. I have my podcast. Uh oh, I do biofeedback remote. So um I can test up to thirty reports on EKGs, EEGs, organs, hormones, skeletal. Uh, it does an EMF report to see if there's anything going on in the home that is affecting your physical body. It's there's a spiritual report that shows if entities or dark forces or anything's going on with that. It shows if there's any viral parasites, infection, bacterial. Um, but anyways, it's a big report. I can do that remote far away. It just takes a screenshot of your field. And then I use my intuitive 
um, as well um, during the consultation to kind of put together a protocol for people to to be integrated. And then I also do soul audits, which I can measure your your width of your biofield because I said some people are bigger, some people are smaller, um, and also your radius. And then I find where you are on the map of consciousness. So um, if you're at shame or fear or courage or willingness, um, Dr. Hawkins, who I don't agree with everything, but he has this map of consciousness and like Jesus was a thousand or is a thousand, love is 500 and I can test where people are and then work with people to bump up higher and get them from maybe 200 to 400 or what have you. And I do coaching um, with homework on ways to, um, to integrate, to get chakras aligned and male and female energies um, correct and we clear uh, emotions if they're, I'll find the top five emotions that are blocking that ability to get into a higher consciousness um, what I'm seeing is um, the um, the more to be cleared uh, when when you start clearing the emotions that are blocking then your map goes up and then also your expansion and your field gets bigger. So the higher you are on the map of consciousness, the bigger your field and your influence is to support as you're moving around and touching and igniting people to love or truth or whatever the situation is. Um, so I, I like helping people. I mean, that's uh, I work with animals. I, um, I have two kittens that I... I've had for a few weeks that I, I bottle feed. I've, I've had 97 kittens in four years and I just like bottle feed them until I, I work with the shelter and they give me the babies that the mom left them or something. And I just feed them until they're two pounds and then we get them fixed and we adopt them out. And sometimes I keep them, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I wouldn't be able to let them go. <laughs> I have kept five. So, uh, and then my daughter kept one and, you know, my husband has, you know, his version. So anyway, yeah, but so, but you guys can find me, my website is swiftfire.org, swift as in quickfire.org.com. And, um, you can find all my social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Telegram and YouTube and uh, lots of interviews, tons of interviews on my channel. They just took my channel down uh, less than a year ago and I had way more content and lots more followers, but I've started over. And um, so, but yeah, I, I had managed to get some of the content back up and but you guys could go there and there's lots of teachings. There's a whole playlist of teaching on EMFs and like the biofield and keto and energy and deprogramming and reprogramming and living in miracles and, you know, lots of like conscious language and uh, health tips and aromatherapy and crystals. And so, yeah, that's kind of some of the things I do. Oh my gosh. Well, I know that we have to do another episode because I already feel people saying, oh my gosh, bring her back on to talk about this, especially stuff like EMF. That's stuff that we're all exposed to, but yet hardly anybody even knows anything about it. You know, so what the work that you're doing is really important because you're talking about a lot of the stuff that is all around us that we aren't trained to even think about. You know, we're all programmed to just think all this stuff is normal around us and to think feeling crappy is normal and to think that the only way to go is western medicine and that there's no way that our bodies can heal ourselves so I'm actually really excited to learn from you a little bit more too and think that your work is just incredible and your energy field I feel it all the way over here you just have this warmth and this beauty about you that I just love and I know everybody on the on the other end can probably feel it too so oh I'm so God. grateful that you came on it means the absolute world to me you touched my heart the first second that I saw you and heard you and you know it's always an honor when I reach out to somebody and they get back to me and it's like they're excited it's like I've, I'm so excited to have you on it makes me and it makes me so happy that people even want to contribute to my little show. So I'm so grateful that, that you not little, on. not little, what you're doing is huge and big and just keep doing it. And you are shiny radiance. You're just beaming. And, um, it's my honor. It's, it's my honor to be here with you. I mean, you're just so precious and I just keep doing what you're doing and stay pure. Like you are. Oh my God. It's just amazing to hear your voice and um, your field is just this magenta 
real uh, strong um, magenta uh, pink, hot, a hot pink color. And it's, it's very tangible and just very magnetic. And um, I just, like I said, it's my honor to spend time with you. And I'm sure you're doing this everywhere you go and people are feeling you everywhere you go. And that's what we need is more people who are in tune and aligned that are here and know why they're here and using their skills and their purpose to actually bring life and love. And, you know, there's so many hurting people right now. And, um, and you are such a big part of what, what you're doing is helping people literally heal. And um, I just, I'm thank you, thankful. So much gratitude for you, Emma. So much gratitude to you too. And for everybody listening, continue to pray for Dr. Charnel. You know, there's no, no matter how higher frequency is, there's always lower frequencies that are trying to infiltrate that. So continue to lift her up in your prayer. I'm going to link all of her links below as many as I can. I always try to do that to make it easy for you guys to connect with the guests. So everything that she said, I'll connect and anything additional that she didn't mention, uh, I'll have her send to me and I'll include that. But please go support her. That's the best way that we can do this. My channel got taken down a few months ago too. And it's heartbreaking whenever you spend so much time and we do this for free. You know, this is free content that we're doing. And oftentimes it costs a lot. So if you guys appreciate her work, please go support her, get her books. Where can people find your books, by the way? Are those on your website? On my website, yes. And I do have an audio too. If you would rather Ooh. listen, you can listen. Uh, only the last one, The Science of Miracles, on a, is on audio, which that's a whole different miracle situation. And some of the audio is different from the book. So, uh, and also there's something about frequency and hearing it. But also, some people are very like visual and, and there's pictures in the book. So, you know, I, I try to make it um, both. That's wonderful. So I'll have all of that link so you guys can go visit her website and support her work. Hire her. I always think it's awesome when we provide the resources for survivors. You know, we want Dr. Charnel to continue to be able to do this 24 seven. And that's going to take us helping resource her. So please go support her. Donate to her by getting a service from her or buying a book and learning. And Dr. Charnel, you're just such a beautiful soul. And I can't wait to connect with you again. And I'm so grateful that you came on today. Awesome. You guys all have a great week and just thank you again for letting me be with it, all of you. And I hope to connect with you. I love, I love all this, but I really miss conferences because I could sit and sign books and like hug people and see their eyes and feel their field. And so what I really love is when people watch something like this and they just send me a quick message and go, Hey, I saw the show with Emma and I just want to say hi or something. And then I have a, I have like a, a direct connection then I could see faces and eyes and like send love and send good vibes and so if you guys are out there and you just want to send a hi or if this has helped you at all like it is encouraging to hear like did this even help anybody <laughs> you know it's like what am I doing it this is good like so um yes uh love all of you and thank you for everybody doing what you're doing where all of you are this is a, an important season in this timeline and people are hurting. So when you go out to the store, smile at people, love on people, hug people. You don't, and there's so many people going through terrible, terrible things and just your eye contact and your smile. You have no idea what you may be doing for someone of just asking, how are you? Are you good? You know, to strangers and just being kind. And those things are so uber important right now. So um, if I could leave with that, that would be my biggest um, invitation for this season and time right now is just be kind and love on purpose right now. And I think that's the perfect place to end today. So thank you guys so much. Connect with us. All the stuff will be in the show notes. Thank you all for listening. As always, we will see you next week and God bless you all. Bye. Okay.